When we think of Vauxhall, we think of one of two things. Either nothing wrong cars made for British families, or a car for 18-year-old chavs to play. Or for music interests like Sag McDonald's with the Halfords body kit and sports air filter. <laughs> But what if I told you that once upon a time, the greatest chassis engineers from Lotus helped Vauxhall create a car which shown the toffs what some good old fashioned tuning can do to a normal executive saloon. What if I also told you that this very car was just as fast, if not faster, than the Ferraris, BMWs and Mercedeses of the time? What if I also told you that this very car was so fast, it was almost banned by the UK government? Well, wonder no more. The Vauxhall Lotus Carlton, the best four-door executive saloon ever made. The infamous Lotus Carlton first started as, well, a Carlton. In 1987, Vauxhall released the Mark III Carlton, which was called the Omega, or Omega, however you want to say it, outside of the UK. Now, it was a rear-wheel drive executive saloon, but was offered as an estate as well. Now, the car was a hit, winning the European Car of the Year award after initial development began in 1981 with General Motors investing £1.5 billion into the design and development of the car and to obviously house new factories to build it in. Nearly 1,400 hours were spent in wind tunnel testing alone, which resulted in a spectacular 0.28 drag coefficient for the saloon and 0.32 for the estate. Having low drag coefficient basically meant the car is more aerodynamic, which in layman's terms means it goes through the air with less resistance. This is helpful for fuel efficiency, obviously, but also performance. Base engine only had around 80 horsepower, but this was good enough for 110 miles an hour, which was very good for 1980. I mean, imagine how fast it would go if it had just 377 horsepower and 568 newton meters of torque, but more on this later. Robert James, the president of General Motors Europe, was upset that the EU division of GM had a reputation of producing quite boring cars. Bored, 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 boring, boring. With outdated technology and engineering. Now, I know what you're thinking. Where does Lotus come into this? Well, let me explain. Nowadays, when a manufacturer wants to make a performance car of an ordinary car they already sell, they will look in-house. Take Hyundai's N-Division or Toyota's Gazoo Racing. However, back then, things worked just a little bit differently. Lotus wasn't just a manufacturer, they had been involved in the development of cars from almost every single manufacturer, and Lotus was then bought by General Motors and therefore was helping them develop the LT5, the V8 engine which would go in the Corvette C1. This may seem a little bit confusing, but the development of the Lotus Carlton actually began as being based on the Senator, another four-door Vauxhall saloon. It was planned to be driven by the same V8 LT5 engine, but Robert wanted the vet and the then-named Lotus Senator to be debuted simultaneously at the 1989 Geneva International Motor Show. But there was a huge issue. The V8 didn't fit. Thus, they resulted into focusing on a inline six engine, but this didn't really work out either, as it would be too expensive, would sell in too few of numbers, and would confuse customers as the Senator was never thought of as being sporty. Whilst the Senator had no prior sporting credentials, the Carlton did with the GSI model despite them both being the same car underneath, the only real difference being the way they looked. So with six weeks to go until the Geneva Motor Show, the entire Lotus Vauxhall thing switched from the Senator to the Carlton. To achieve the goal of creating the fastest sports saloon of its time, they developed a 24-valve 3.6 litre straight six, putting out 377 horsepower, which is slightly more than the V8 they intended to use prior, and 419 foot-pounds of torque, which was 50 more than the intended V8, and 150 more torques than the next most powerful four-door saloon, the M5. Thanks to the low drag coefficient, which means it didn't really need much power to be fast in the first place, it had a top speed of 177 miles an hour, just 3 miles an hour off the Ferrari Testarossa, making it the fastest four-door saloon in the world. For the fastest car in the world. Here it is. However, the German government actually rated it at 182 miles an hour, as there was a little trick to bypass some form of speed limiter, which was activated on all Lotus Carlton's given to the media for reviews. 
The high top speed and the price of £48,000 when new in 1990, which is a whole lot less than the Ferraris and Porsches at the time, made it very controversial in the UK. But this was odd, as Ferraris and Porsches hadn't been doing similar speeds for a while now. But when a humble Vauxhall is just as fast, if not faster, then people had an issue. Sir Anthony Grant in the House of Commons in 1990 is quoted as saying, these Lotus Carltons are cars which require the skill of Nigel Mansell to operate them safely. Another MP, Alex Carlyle, held an even higher prejudice to the fast Vauxhall asking, will the honorary gentleman join me in condemning the heavy publicity that's been given to the recent Vauxhall Carlton, which is capable of apparently achieving 170 miles an hour? Even the automotive press was calling it to be banned, such as the editor of Autocar, wanting Vauxhall to limit its top speed as its outrageous top speed is dangerous marketing and just plain immature and the Daily Mail also longed for its riddance. I do wonder how these exact same people react to just how fast cars are now. I mean, a Civic Type R can literally do 170 miles an hour these days. The irony of it all is that there was no outrage when your premium sports cars could do the same thing. So the problem wasn't its top speed, nor it being unsafe, rather that it was accessible by the middle class. I mean, it was a Ferrari Testarossa for half the money. The hatred towards the car made no sense. The entire reason for its calling of the calling was that if you ain't rich, you ain't have got the skills to drive it. But they did get one fear right. Its potential use for, well, crime. Now this reg rings a bell in just about any cultured enthusiast, especially those in Great Britain, or you watched the brilliant video on this car by Jason Kamitza. The 40RA Lotus Carlton was owned by Richard Austin. Unlike your Escort and Sierra Cozzi's of the time, Cozzi, that's the way you say it actually, of the time, which thieves loved, the Carlton was relatively timid looking. Yes, it had huge fenders making it wider than an American's waist, along with a spoiler enough to make a JDM enthusiast green with envy, but to the ignorance, they'll be none the wiser. Sadly for Richard, his beloved 40RA was stolen at 5am on the 25th of November 1993 by four men. He confronted the sinners, which ended up with a punch in the face. As he came back to consciousness, he heard the sounds of crunching bodywork. It was his Carlton being pumped up the road by, you guessed it, a Sierra Cosworth. You seriously could not make this up. Two council estate supercars, both being used as partners in crime. Exactly what the parliament feared happening. It's the hellcat of its time, really. Now, trying to rescue his pride and joy, Richard hopped into his family, a spas. Brilliant car, by the way. Oddly, though, he could see a Vauxhall Cavalier, another brilliant car as well, coming his way in reverse. Unsure of whether the four men were armed and how the Espas was now badly damaged, he gave up in his pursuit. Now, and off went the Carlton, ready for a life of crime. Just six weeks after the unfortunate theft of Richard's beloved Carlton, 40 RA had been involved in 11 ram raids. The fact that thieves kept the red plates on rather than getting rid of it or at least changing it to a different Carlton to dodge the heat, they obviously weren't doing this just for money but rather for fun as they knew they could never, ever be caught. The 11th attack is the quote-unquote best the 40 RA Carlton ever committed. And to just make this clear, I am by no means glamorizing the thieves acts. This video is purely to make an example of just how insane the Lotus Carlton was for its time. Understand? Anyway. On the 6th of Jan 1994, the gang reversed the 40RA Carlton into the newsagents right outside a police station. Yes, right outside a police station. The, it was the very newsagent on screen right now, but at the time of the robbery, it was called Super 6. Police tried to stop them, but to no avail. The 40RA Carlton sped off on the motorway to a speed of up to 160 miles an hour, the police at the time explained. The only option was air support, which was pretty, which was a pretty new thing back then. This shook the crims, as it may very well have been the reason the car was abandoned, and thus an end to their antics. Some people still argue wh about whether this is true or not, as this car is a huge mystery in the UK. If you ask any British person whether they've heard of the 40RA, prepare for a debate over whether it was found or not, or if it did indeed outrun a police helicopter. If the debate does come up, though, you'll want to remember this. A recovery driver named Craig Tipping went to the canal near Knoll, which was where the 40RA was supposed to be, and it was 
found. It was suspected that the criminals would scratch their police chase itch once more in another Carlton, or your stereotypical fast forwards, which I'll make another video on very, very soon. But this wasn't the case, as the sinners seem to have scratched the itch entirely, and they've had their fun and were enjoying the spoils of their crimes, which totaled at £20,000. The Vauxhall Carlton. The car the police simply couldn't catch. Thank you for watching this passion project of mine. The Lotus, Voxel, Lotus, Carlton Omega, Opal, Senator thing, or whatever you want to call it, is my favourite car ever made. It really is, not just because of its infamous history, but rather as an example of proper British engineering. It's a testament to just how great Great Britain is. We have done so many truly amazing things, which receive such little praise. Hence, I'm here to make a love letter to the car itself. This car is an example of why so many motorsport teams are based in Britain. When it comes to racing, Britain does it best. If there is one car I could bring back from the catalogues, it would be this. You may say that, well, Lotus has brought back the Omea, which is a four-door electric saloon. But I see your point, but it's a Chinese electric-made junk, so no, it doesn't really count. I would like it to be made by the guys at Cosworth, as they're the geniuses of all the council stake supercars. Thinking about a modern Cosworth-powered, you know, Carlton has given me the James May fizz. I may wonder why I'm not wanting Lotus to make it, but that's a topic for another video. This has been How to Spec, thank you for watching all the way through, and have a great rest of your day. Make sure to like, comment, share this video to friends, and subscribe with notifications on, so you never miss an upload. Now that the obligatory YouTuber begging is over, goodbye.